Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending the webinar, How to Prevent Child Exploitation Online, a Call to Action for Investors. I am Elena Spinoza, and I am Social Issues Manager at the BRI. Um, just a reminder that today's webinar will be recorded and then will be available on PRI's YouTube channel. Um, so today we'll be hearing from a series of speakers that will talk to you about the governance of ICT companies and the role in protecting users of which children are the most vulnerable. This is very much in line with the PRI's work on social issues, particularly around investors' responsibilities to respect human rights and to act with due diligence in line with the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, or UNGPs, and the OECD guidelines. We will hear introductory remarks from Daniel Essing, and Daniel is a director at Robico's Active Ownership Department. She has over 12 years of experience engaging companies on human rights-related topics and encouraging them to operate with greater, greater awareness and respect for human rights. She currently has a specific focus on the ICT sector, and Ms. Essing joined the Active Ownership Department in 2007, and she also holds a master's degree in Law and Business Administration from the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. We'll then hear from Anjan Bosse uh, on the issue of child exploitation online, and he will present you with trends, but also with solutions. And then is a child protection specialist at the UNICEF headquarters in New York. He is the technical focal point for UNICEF work to address ICT-related violence, exploitation, and abuse of children. He co-managed the 2015-2016 UNICEF global practice to build capacity to tackle online child sexual exploitation under the We Protect initiative. He has extensive experience of over 15 years in the prevention of online child sexual exploitation and abuse and has served widely as a resource person for governments, international organizations, civil society, and the private sector and law enforcement. He had been the chair of the Dynamic Coalition on Child and Life Safety uh, at the Internet Governance Forum for six years and had led global efforts to address child sexual exploitation online, including representation at major, major world conferences uh, on this issue. And then has a background in computer engineering and is very passionate in transforming technology for, for children's safeguarding and development. Um, we will we'll then move on to Jacqueline uh, Boucher, who will talk to you about how Microsoft responds to and act on this issue. Jacqueline is the Chief Online Safety Officer at Microsoft Corporation. In this role, she is responsible for all aspects of Microsoft's online safety strategy, including um, cross-company policy creation and implementation influence over consumer safety features and functionality and communications to and engagement with a variety of external audiences. She currently serves as an international advisory board member to the UK government sponsor We, uh, we Protect Global Alliance to, to End Child Sexual Exploitation Online. She is a member of the INHOP's uh, advisory board as well as the Better Internet for Kids advisory board led by the European Commission. She has previously um, served as Microsoft representative to the board of directors of the National Cybersecurity Alliance, the Technology Coalition, and the Family Online Safety Institute. Um, Jacqueline has spent nearly 20 years at Microsoft leading various groups and efforts um, that evangelize the company's commitment to safer, more trusted online experiences for people of all ages and medical abilities. Before joining Microsoft, uh, Jacqueline was an attorney in private practice in New Jersey, New, jo New York, and Washington, D.C. A second career lawyer, she spent 12 years as a real-time financial news correspondent and editor-in-charge, most recently with Reuters America Incorporated in New York. And last but by no means least, we will hear from Tracy Rumbert, who will bring the investor perspective and provide a call to action for all other investors inter interested in how to tackle this issue. Tracy is responsible for active ownership strategies at CBIS, focused on engagement with boards, corporate management regulators, and fellow investors to encourage robust environmental human um, corporate management, um, human rights, and corporate governance practices worldwide. She joined CBIS in 2016 and has over 18 years of experience in responsible investment and corporate engagement, including uh, on the issues of climate change, responsible lending, governance, and labor and human rights. Tracy previously served as Director of Investor Programs at Series at USF, the Forum for Sustainable and Responsible Investment as head of its Shareholder Action Network, and a Pax World Fund and the Service Employees International Union, where she coordinated shareholder engagement at each. 
She has authored several guides on shareholder advocacy, including 21st century engagement, investor strategies, and incorporating ESG considerations into corporate interactions, which she co-published with BlackRock in 2015. She began her career path as an environmental journalist. So at the end of the presentation, the audience will be able to um, post questions to all speakers, and you can do this using the question and answer box at the bottom right of your screen. Also, if you have questions along the way, just feel free to ask them and the during the presentations as they are happening. Um, and we will cover these again at the end in the Q&A session. Um, thank you again for listening. And Danielle, over to you. Thank you, Elena, for, uh, for the introduction and for organizing this webinar today. Um, today's webinar is really about raising awareness for a topic that I believe has not really received as much attention in the investment, investor community as it deserves. Um, we really hope to inform you about the severity of the issues, what leading companies are doing about it, and also what tools are available for investors. Um, but I would like to take, take you a little bit back on my own experience and, and thoughts about the ICT sector. So if I look back at what my company's focus has been in the ICT sector, it has really been about uh, topics like privacy, freedom of expression, and cybersecurity that have been at, at the top of our engagement agenda for the past years. And in an effort to really further the implementation of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights and also the OECD responsible business conduct for institutional investors, we have shifted our focus also towards uh, human rights due diligence with companies in order really to understand how they, they identify and address human rights impacts and also rights holders in their business and value chain. With regard to the topic of today, have they, for example, looked at the impact of their services on children? Um, not only are children online themselves and sh um, should encounter appropriate content, the services of IT ICT companies are also used by abusers. Technology companies are therefore facing increasing risks for their impact on children. Many of these risks are interrelated, complex, and really range from data privacy issues for children, cyberbullying, and also the risk of child exploitation. Child exploitation online is a growing risk facing children, and ICT companies do not seem to be keeping up with the trends and impacts, or are at least not very transparent about it, leaving investors in the dark on how this issue is managed. So for our engagement work, um, we like to be involved in collaborative initiatives for investors organized by organizations like the Principles for Responsible Investment um, and also the Investor Alliance for Human Rights and the ICCR in the US. Being able to work together with other investors is key for us, especially on a topic like human rights that can be complex and multifaceted. And through collaboration, we feel we can build capacity, come to companies with one voice, and truly have an impact. For this purpose, we have also joined the working group on child exploitation set up by Tracy Rambert of CBIS, who will be speaking on this webinar about the expectations guidance we are developing as a group. Um, and obviously, we will also be hearing, um, as mentioned by Elena, from an NGO perspective of UNICEF and the company perspective of Microsoft. So now over to you, Anjan, to hear about the key trends and solutions to child exploitation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, PRI, for having us uh, present uh, today at this webinar. Uh, and this is a very important issue for us. So uh, as we all know, uh, it's an established fact that digital technology has already changed the world. And as more and more children go online around the world, it is increasingly changing uh, their childhood. Uh, we need to understand the consequences of digital environment for children uh, in the context of rights, as specified in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, it is important to recall uh, the range of rights to which children are entitled under these instruments. And these are not only you know, children's rights to protection from all forms of violence, but also their rights to participation and provision. And as uh, Daniel was mentioning earlier, uh, the right to you know, privacy uh, and the freedom of expression are very important. And as a UNICEF, uh, we have to balance the whole uh, uh, spectrum of rights that children uh, you know, are entitled to. 
uh, both research and uh, evidence and the experience of stakeholders uh, of uh, child rights organizations suggest that children's lives are uh, currently, you know, and increasingly mediated by digital environment in ways that influence how they can exercise their rights and how their rights may be in enriched or infringed, uh, either supported or neglected. Uh, whether the digital world is seen as a potential risk for children or enabler for children's rights, it is certainly uh, a strong, you know, uh, it has a strong impact in the welfare of, of their lives, and it is something uh, that is irreversible. It's going to stay. Uh, so for us, uh, I think we have to, as a group, uh, we really have to see how we can empower children, give them access, but at the same time, um, you know, uh, keep them protected. Uh, next slide, please. So without the proper safeguards, the world's most disadvantaged children will face even greater risk when exposed to online risks of harm. The internet and digital technologies have really amplified traditional dangers and created different forms of risk and new forms of harm. Uh, we have to be really cognizant of the fact that uh, risks are harm, uh, risk and harm are not really um, the same. So basically, uh, not all risks uh, leads to harms, and um, uh, you know that uh, we have ways of coping up with uh, risks. Uh, but at the same time, we need to be cognizant of the, the key risks that children face uh, through these technologies. In terms of uh, the summary, uh, we can group them into four main categories, where children are exposed to violent content online, such as videos or images depicting sexual violence or unwanted exposure to adult content. Uh, children who are using uh, technology may be putting themselves at risk. This may be uh, sharing high personal information, including sexualized images and videos. Um, another risk where children you know, establish relationship with ch uh, people online that they do not know previously and where they are unaware of the risk of potential consequences. Uh, the third area is that children can be victims of peer behavior. Uh, uh, it was alluded to by Daniel earlier that children are cyberbullied online. And um, through the internet and digital technologies, we are seeing more invasive forms of bullying and harassment. Uh, and you know, uh, we know that cyberbullying is really a pressing issue. But for the purpose of this webinar, uh, really, uh, we want to focus uh, on the fourth category, where children are victims of online sexual abuse and exploitation. So at UNICEF, we adopt this typology that you see on the screen to categorize the various forms of risk and harm under three main categories, uh, which is content, contact, and conduct. And within this, you know, content risk of where a child is exposed to unwelcome and inappropriate content or illegal content such as child sexual abuse materials uh, are distributed through the internet. Contact risk of where a child participates in a risky communication either with the peers or with the perpetrator, and the conduct risk relates to the dynamics of an offender and a victim. Another way we can understand uh, the various categories is the harms that, that may much of children's use of digital technologies and those that come about by the offender's misuse. So I think we really need to be mindful of these two dynamics. One is where children, through their interaction, either intentionally or uh, unintentionally, uh, you know, are in uh, contact with, uh, with people that they don't know who might want to offend them, or the, you know, in some, some situations, they have uh, nothing to do. Uh, you know, uh, or what they, there is nothing that um, they what, what they do online has uh, any uh, implication on on their uh, you know uh, what they face because the organized criminal networks uh, are uh, really dedicated and uh, very uh, pervasive and persuasive. Uh, to to get to these uh, children, so we really have to kind of keep these two things uh, separate. For the purpose of today's session, I'll be highlighting the primary risks uh, uh, related to sexual abuse and exploitation through the use of internet uh, and communication technologies. So we know that um, uh, children are sexually abused and exploited on offline. Basically, they are. Uh, either tortured, raped, or you know, physically uh, abused so that those images uh, can be then distributed through the internet. 
uh, and uh, there is a huge demand for it. Uh, we know offenders categorize this information, they collect this information, they are very possessive about these uh, uh, images and material, you know, increasingly videos. Um, for example, uh, one, one of the hidden services uh, has over 15,000 registered members where subscribers are required to revalidate their membership monthly by uploading either 20 images or a two-minute video of an infant uh, or a toddler abuse. And um, what is really, really um, uh, shocking uh, is when children grow up through this series of images uh, where they are tortured uh, they're, you know, over a period of time, and they, they're they grow up, they, they, they don't experience, they don't enjoy their childhood. They are trapped, uh, and uh, these images are, are the only evidence of their growing um, you know, in isolation and these images are then circulated and collected by the uh, by the offenders. Uh, children are groomed online. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, uh, next one. Yeah. Uh, children are uh, groomed online either for contact offenses or they are coerced to produce sexual materials, which are then used to uh, as means for further blackmailing to continue the exploitive process. So, um, you know, uh, I, I mentioned uh, that children's images uh, are produced offline and then distributed uh, online. But uh, increasingly, we know that um, in certain parts of the world, children are subjected to uh, live uh, streaming, basically, which means children are brought in front of webcam either directly uh, you know, through the intermediaries or their families uh, who are connected uh, by the offenders um, by remotely. They can be anywhere in the world uh, and dictating this abuse uh, remotely. And um, I will just present a case uh, in the subsequent slides where we will talk about a, a child in the Philippines, an eight-year-old child who was, um, uh, you know, uh, doing this uh, uh, for a for an exchange of money. Uh, she's eight years old, and um, it's it's really painful to see, uh, you know, a child at this age. Uh, has no choice uh, but to be uh, falling victim uh, to the desires of uh, of these offenders. Um, and she was paid like 300 uh, Filipino peso uh, for each act. And this was this uh, given to her through the intermediary who was in the neighborhood and who was uh, controlling her behavior uh, and being dictated uh, by the offender. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, the other can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, the exact number of children who are victims of online child sexual exploitation is unknown. However, uh, we, we uh, re a report from IWF, the Internet Watch Foundation in the UK, reveals that uh, you know children uh, are pretty much uh, from their living room uh, are approached, uh, coerced, and blackmailed. Uh, to produce uh, the live streaming uh, of their own sexual abuse, and out of which 96% of these victims uh, were girls. Um, and 96% uh, showed a child on their own in a home environment, and 40% of the abuse was categorized as category A or B, which uh, is a very uh, severe form of abuse. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just a quick um, demonstration of the proliferation of these images over the internet, again from IWF. Uh, you will be able to to, uh, to view these slides, uh, uh, you know, later on. So uh, let me just move in for the sake of time. Um, another thing I, I would like to highlight is that there is a link between uh, travel uh, uh, and tourism, uh, and how the traveling sex offenders use the internet um, to assist each other, uh, find information, uh, contact a victim, and then you know use the resources that are available to do uh, in contact abuse when they're in the destination. Next slide, please. Um, 
so basically, uh, uh, you know, we 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 can understand, uh, uh, you know, the dynamics of uh, what the, the internet uh, offers to the uh, offenders um, to, you know, uh, distribute their images, store their images on the cloud, um, uh, and you know, using the encrypted channels to secure their anonymity. Uh, so there is a range of different things uh, that are facilitating these crimes against children and uh, children's uh, own behavior sometimes when they produce uh, their own images uh, get distributed uh, are adding uh, uh, to their collection and adding to the demand so we we just have to um, you know be mindful that this is not going to change it's only going to increase with the proliferation of the internet and the acceptance of the internet as a result uh, we need a global solution because the whole world is now getting connected and uh, I just want to very briefly mention uh, the we protect global initiative which is a collaborative uh, uh, initiative it's an alliance of uh, civil society private sector uh, government and intergovernmental organizations um, across the world and they have come up with a model uh, which uh, addresses uh, holistically and comprehensively uh, the uh, issue of uh, child sexual abuse and exploitation and within this category you will definitely see a, a very uh, definite stand for the industry uh, uh, industry is as I said is a member um, Jacqueline will present uh, their work what they're doing but I just wanted to make sure uh, can we go to the next slide please um, you know I, I'll skip this because uh, for the sake of time I'll go directly into the you know yeah so uh, what, what are we really uh, expecting the industry to do is to put policies and operational procedures for acting uh, on notice and takedown processes because that is uh, you know the key uh, priority within the we protect that we want these materials to be removed we don't want these materials to be circulated accessible and uh, traded by the offenders in the first place because these are depiction of the crimes that that a children experience uh, and their victimization and pr proliferation of these uh, images uh, throughout the internet will only extend, it, extend their uh, abuse and victimization. Uh, establishing policies and practice for staff training and welfare, developing relationship and working with key stakeholders such as law enforcement, and establishing a dedicated function to investigate and take appropriate action against child sexual abuse material. Next slide. Um, and uh, again, these are uh, very uh, definite uh, steps that our company uh, can take uh, in order to show their commitment and uh, show some clear procedures uh, within the company uh, to deal with child sexual abuse material. But I would just also want to add that uh, apart from uh, dealing with child sexual abuse and exploitation, we also want the company to be proactive in you know designing tools to detect and um, address you know uh, these images as when they are produced and distributed and uh, have their own mechanisms to educate users and uh, to be more visible there you know to, whether through their supply chain through their retailing uh, units uh, we, we just want to make sure that these policies are ingrained and embedded uh, in their product and des uh, um, product development and service delivery uh, so that it doesn't come as an afterthought uh, next slide please yeah uh, so basically this summarizes uh, the you know the priority uh, actions that UNICEF uh, encourages everyone to put children in the center of uh, our attention, center of our digital uh, policy uh, in every aspect of our work. Uh, and um, I just wanted to conclude by saying that um, uh, what children experience online uh, is uh, not in isolation. It is something uh, as an extension of their offline environment and interaction. And as a society, we, we really need to work together and we need to be uh, addressing the demand uh, for uh, child sexual exploitation and we need to end the violence against children in all walks of our life so that uh, we can bring that and we can take specific measures in the online world. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be with you to share what Microsoft is, is doing in this space. 
I always like to start um, with the definition of online safety. Uh, as Elena said at the beginning, I'm the chief online safety officer. And I think when people hear that phrase, they don't exactly know what it means. Online safety from our perspective is about helping people and enabling people to maximize their desirable online experiences by minimizing those associated with what I call the four C's. So you heard three of the C's from Anjan. We add a fourth one at Microsoft, not only content, contact, and conduct, but also commerce. And in and of themselves, those four words are pretty innocuous, but when we talk about illegal content, or inappropriate contact or conduct or illegitimate commerce, we're operating in the online safety realm. And of course, protecting children online, protecting all vulnerable populations is a key component of online safety. I'm sure you understand what we mean when we say the four C's, but I just wanna draw one distinction because I think we are slightly different from UNICEF and Anjan's model here. But with contact and conduct, we look at those basically as two sides of the same coin. When it comes to contact, we're looking at the issue from the target's perspective, from the victim's perspective, and conduct we're looking at from the actor's perspective or the perpetrator's perspective. I just wanna give you an overview of Microsoft's products and services because unlike some of the social media or video sharing platforms, Microsoft is very diverse in its product and service offerings. We are in search, we are in gaming, we are in video chat, we are in cloud storage, we are in email, we are in the browser, we have the operating system, and we're also in hardware. These are all under the Microsoft umbrella, but each product and service has its own goals and objectives in terms of delighting customers with unique interactive online experiences. So from a policy perspective, as Anjan and others also mentioned, we're always weighing a sizable number of policy considerations and variables. For instance, Bing, which is our search engine, aims to be an open and unbiased research information and action tool. So any limits on speech or expression or access to information must be carefully considered. OneDrive, meanwhile, is uh, our cloud storage solution for consumers, and it seeks to be that consumer's what we call hard drive in the sky. So affording uh, an attendant expectation of privacy when you have a service like that. I just wanna share with you briefly the Microsoft Service Agreement. This is online and it governs, governs the terms of use of Microsoft's consumer services. The MSA includes a code of conduct and I've highlighted some of the relevant portions here. Specifically, don't do anything illegal. Don't do anything that harms, exploits, or threatens to harm children. And don't do anything that's harmful to you, the user, the services, or others. This agreement serves as the basis for our content moder moderation efforts broadly at the company. So again, we wanna look at our approach. We wanna look at our strategy to online safety and a host of other domains and issues. At Microsoft, we've sought to protect people online for nearly two decades. And this, this approach is largely fourfold. We focus on technology, we focus on self-governance, we focus on education, we focus on partnerships. Again, first and foremost, we're a technology company. We have a responsibility to seek to create software, devices, and services that have safety features and functionality and considerations built in from the outset. We, we also devise and implement our internal policies and standards and procedures these extend uh, beyond just our pure legal requirements because we're trying to self-govern our product development and our operations always with child and consumer safety top of mind. We also have a responsibility to stay abreast of the risks that are out there. And these are risks that individuals and families may face online. So we alert consumers to these developments. We try to educate them about how they can best protect themselves and their families. And most importantly, we embrace this multi-stakeholder model. We collaborate with others because no one entity or organization can successfully tackle these, these novel and significant and very nuanced issues on their own. And I offer our two, links to our two websites here, microsoft.com forward slash safer online is where we have a host of resources for consumers and educational materials. And we've also started uh, three and a half years ago, our campaign for what we call digital civility. And you can find more information at that website link. So we talked about the code of conduct that Microsoft has, and we know that the number one point is not to do anything illegal. 
So I wanted to share with you the specific code section that obligates technology companies to report child sexual exploitation and abuse imagery when, it become, when we become aware of it as existing on our services. Section 2258A of Title 18 of the United States Code sets out this legal requirement. Companies must report to the U.S. National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, what we know as NECMEC, again, when we are made aware that this illegal material exists on our services. And I'd like to show you briefly what a cyber tip report to NECMEC looks like. Here we have reports from Bing, from Xbox Live, and from Skype. Everything obviously is redacted for privacy considerations, but you get the general idea of the kind of reports that companies need to file with NECMEC. So turning to detecting this material, there are effectively three ways that a technology company can learn that this heinous material exists on its services through what I call reactive, active, and proactive moderation. Reactive moderation takes place when we receive reports from customers, from governments, from members of civil society, even the general public, about this material existing on our services. They tell us where it is and we take action. We verify, in fact, that the imagery is what was reported to us. We file a cyber tip report with the National Center. We quarantine and preserve the evidence, which is also required by law, and we close the offender's account at the MSA level, what we looked at earlier, with no chance for account or content reinstatement. Employee Microsoft's photo DNA robust hash matching technology is an example of active moderation. Again, we report this content to NECMEC because we're required to do so by law, but we look for it because we have an obligation to protect our customers and the integrity of our services. I'll explain a little bit more about how photo DNA works in a bit, but I just want you to know that this technology allows a comp company to find duplicates of known illegal imagery on its services. And like reactive moderation, again, we verify that the imagery is what it purports to be. We file a cyber tip with NECMEC, we quarantine and preserve the evidence, and we close the offender's account at the MSA level with no chance for reinstatement. Finally, proactive moderation involves using artificial intelligence or machine learning to detect new content or material. I'll also share an example of this shortly, but again, like the other two categories of content moderation, we verify that the content is what it purports to be, we file a cyber tip with NECMEC, we quarantine and preserve the evidence, and again, we close the offender's account at the MSA level with no chance for reinstatement. So it's quite challenging, as you can imagine, to, to summarize nearly 20 years of work and activity in, in just a few minutes. So I'm sharing this timeline as an overview of Microsoft's contributions to the fight against child sexual exploitation and abuse imagery online. And I'd like to provide a brief narrative as to our journey. The company first became aware of the magnitude of these online horrors in 2003. That was when a lead detective with the Toronto Police Department sent an email to our then CEO, Bill Gates, asking for help from technology to track down purveyors of child sexual exploitation and abuse material and for assistance with the detective's goal of rescuing child victims. Microsoft responded with a $1 million investment and the creation of a te technology that is still in use today by some law enforcement agencies to share information into child sexual exploitation investigations. Our commitment to create technology tools to fight against online child exploitation continued in subsequent years, and that resulted in a technology that has been referred to as the single most significant contribution to the fight against child sexual exploitation and abuse imagery to date. Again, Microsoft developed PhotoDNA in cooperation with Dartmouth College. This was in 2009. We then donated that technology to the U.S. National Center for Missing and Exploited Children that same year, and we now license it for free to more than 150 companies and international organizations, all playing a role in helping to stamp out this heinous imagery. As you can imagine, the task of finding and removing child sexual exploitation and abuse images once they are online is very difficult. Much of this material circulates over the internet time and time again, sometimes decades after the initial crime occurred, the child has been rescued and the abuser brought to justice. But each instance, in which these crime scene photos are viewed, 
The children depicted in them, they are re-victimized. PhotoDNA aids in finding and removing from the internet some of the worst of the worst of these images. It, it, very, very briefly, the technology creates what we call a, a digital signature, sim similar to a fingerprint of the image. And that can be compared with signatures of other images that we know are already bad, illegal online. And we're looking for copies of that original. So today, PhotoDNA is used by the National Center, Microsoft itself, various government agencies, domestic and international law enforcement, and many of our foremost industry counterparts. In November just of last year, uh, Microsoft hosted a high-level event on our campus in Redmond, Washington, alongside what we call our 360-degree cross-industry hackathon to combat online child grooming for sexual purposes. This event was held in collaboration with the We Protect Global Alliance, the Child Dignity Alliance, and the United Kingdom uh, government, Her Majesty's government. It was attended by the UK Home Secretary, who has made fighting child sexual exploitation and abuse imagery online a signature event of his term. The event produced a prototype technology to detect in historical text-based message conversations potential instances of child online grooming for sexual purposes. This prototype is based on a Microsoft patented technology, and it is still in testing and training. We're holding a follow-up, what we're calling a mini hack in the next few weeks to continue to improve on this technology. The goal all along was to make this tool available free of charge, much like we have done with PhotoDNA. And this would be another example of proactive moderation, again, using machine learning techniques to train uh, technologies to be able to detect new information, new content, new material. I drafted a blog about this event and we posted a video to our YouTube channel uh, featuring a series of speakers who participated in the event. I would encourage you to look uh, at both of those if you have some time. And finally, I've provided a sampling of organizations and groups, many that we work with, and all of these groups focus on this issue and they are global, they are spread across the world. Uh, again, it's not an exhaustive list, but I suggest that you have a look at some of their initiatives and programs to become familiar with some of their work, and they will help to uh, put this issue a little bit more in context with some rich detail. So thank you, and I look forward to the rest of this, the discussion. Thank you so much for that, Jacqueline, and thank you for um, putting in context and, and what does it mean, like everything that Anjan was telling us about, how does Microsoft put that in practice and how do you monitor those issues. And uh, now I'm going to give the floor to Tracy Rampert, as she's going to speak to you from the perspective of investors and what can investors do um, to then engage with companies in, in this issue. Good day, everyone. My name is Tracy Rumbert, and I specialize in corporate engagement for CBIS, which is an asset manager for Catholic institutions worldwide. When CBIS first delved in this issue, after working on human trafficking issues for a decade, we quickly realized that this one was complex and featured many acronyms and legal regimes and, frankly, a whole ecosystem of activity that was addressing this risk that we needed to better understand. So we took the time in late 2016 and 2017 to interview NGOs, law enforcement, um, some companies, and academics in order to know the players, key trends, practices employed by companies to disrupt this activity, and where some of the gaps were. This first slide shows some of that due diligence um, for us to get up to speed and properly start asking questions of companies. And when we did, we got a very tepid response at first, uh, with many companies ignoring us or sending us directly to investor relations to maybe answer one basic question. It would take over a year to even be put into contact with the right online safety staff for most of our engagements, if that staff existed. So we ramped up engagement in 2018 and began sending out joint sign-on letters to companies and filing the first shareholder resolutions on the subject, but only filing when a company had had a poor or no response for over a year of contact. And what we heard from companies was, we have a policy that prohibits child sex imagery, and we work with NECMEC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, or other child exploitation hotlines in some way to report images reported to us. 
we are doing what our peers are doing, and more. But when we probe the companies on their knowledge of what their peers were doing, their answers would falter. They would ask us to provide a summary of examples of what peer companies were actually doing. Um, and we saw that pretty consistently. And this raised some flags for CBIS as we seemed to hear that reframe over and over. And it was unclear to us if the companies we were speaking to really knew what leading practice was on the issue and if they were monitoring the escalating trends in this space. So while we established deeper contact with some companies, we also decided to escalate our engagements with those that had pretty poor responses. On slide two, whoop, excuse me, it is sensitive. Um, we note the list of resolutions that were filed and the outcomes thus far. A resolution at Verizon Communications is coming to a vote May the 2nd, and it will be the first test case on this topic since the first proposal filed with Apple was withdrawn. So some other things that we learned from these engagements thus far, um, both in the back and forth with companies during the resolution process, the initial contact, and, and other means. Uh, while the general public rarely talks about these risks, they really are escalating, in, in our opinion, at a fairly rapid pace. So in 2018, there were 18.4 million images of child sex abuse or exploitation that were recorded by NECMEC. And that is 6,000 times more than the 3,000 images found in 1998. Um, and that's noted by one Google official that was recently interviewed in January. The age range of children being impacted, as Anjan noted in his slides, goes from infancy to 18 years old, but there are a number of reports showing an increase in exploitation of children under the age of 10. And children under the age of 10, Obviously, you see it on the streets, you see it everywhere. They have these devices, they have smartphones, they have tablets. Some abusers are targeting children five and under because they are considered pre-communicative, meaning they're not able to, um, and not as capable of describing their abusers or the abuses happening to them to law enforcement or other agencies as an older child might. So they're you know, a higher target value. And as the volume of images or postings um, that need to be monitored outpaces companies' abilities to keep up with it, you know, we felt that something needed to happen, that companies needed to be gently encouraged, encouraged, pressed in some cases to do more. So just, you know, to take a statistic, every minute YouTube has over 300 hours of video uploaded to its platforms. So in one year, that equals 158 million hours of video just on one platform and, you know, that needs to be monitored, scanned, moderated, you know, um, looked at to identify abusive behaviors. And it seems to us that there are not enough moderators at companies, that they have to make the call on what is allowed and what is not in mere seconds sometimes that their job is one of the toughest in the industry and it doesn't always pay well. It is sometimes outsourced to contractors and there's psychological harm to workers and experts in identifying, studying, and keeping these images off the web and cloud storage systems. And the pace of staffing, of investments needed in tech tools and artificial intelligence and other responses are not keeping pace with the number of incidents as we see them. It seems to us that companies and governments, you know, do need to up their game since ultimately human eyes are the ones that need to make the call of whether or not an image or an activity is one of children in sexually abusive situations. If you're going to accuse someone of a major crime, you need to make sure you're getting it right. So technology is doing a lot right now to triage these images and this activity and the spectrum of abuse is taking place, but technology cannot be relied on alone to solve this problem. So the number two you know, thing that we noticed was companies are very, very sensitive about this issue. They don't want to talk about it and they don't want to report anything on it, even if they're doing some things well. Number three, when they are doing something substantial, they have to be very careful about what they share, even with us, in confidence in meetings. And this can be really frustrating for investors. Um, but we need to understand, I think, as a community, that the main goal is to keep children safe 
So some tools, processes, or technologies that are used need to remain private and in company hands. But that does not mean that investors can't be asking for metrics, aggregated statistics, the resources spent on fighting this fight, the staffing devoted to the issue, what is board oversight and understanding of the risk, what are the investments made in new technologies, and moderation of content. So, you know, from those takeaways, I'm suggesting a couple key questions to think about, you know, that might be relevant to companies that you hold. You know, so core questions might be, do you have a policy prohibiting types of child sex exploitation? And do you have protocols for identifying and removing such imagery or activity? Because Jacqueline spoke to the U.S. market, other markets might have different legal obligations and regimes, and this really is a global issue, global crimes, global abuses taking place. And in many cases, one incident could involve many, many countries, so it gets complex. So it's good to just build consistency at the company level where we can um, you know, to help combat the abuses. Two, how do you enforce these policies on your platforms? And Jacqueline spoke, you know, pretty well about that. And what are the consequences for users or third parties that breach them? Do you invest in user education on the online risk and how to report these abuses? And that's education of kids, parents, and educators. What are some of the examples of innovative campaigns or partnerships in this area? How many people do you estimate you have reached with your campaigns on this issue? Um, do you as a company invest in new technological tools, in artificial intelligence, and in innovations to disrupt this behavior? What kinds of investments generally? And are they commensurate with the risk you as a company currently face? Do you, Company X, you know, partner with child protection experts to better understand trends, approaches, and solutions? Do you partner with other companies or your industry? Do you interview or survey children on their use of the Internet or you know, their use of your own systems and services to better understand risk and trends? How and where does the company report on what it is doing? Where is there room for improvement on that reporting? Do you have metrics or other ways to measure effectiveness internally? And that was key with some of the conversations we recently had where the company would make a list of things they were doing, but we could not really get a sense of, did they have goals to move forward and make progress? Were they internally assessing really what they were currently doing, if it made sense and if it was effective in combating the abuses? Um, you know, uh, what is the board doing, how is it involved in this issue, what oversight does it have, has it been briefed on the issue and challenges, what is the board's role when a child exploitation controversy actually occurs at a company, and then how is the company advocated for regulations or legislation in any jurisdiction that improves protections for children online. So what can investors do in 2019 um, you know, and beyond as, as we look to make progress on this issue? So one, there are sign-on letter opportunities to companies in the IT sector that keep rolling out, um, and those are often posted on the PRI collaboration platform or ICCR or other networks. There are shareholder resolutions that can be filed or co-filed, and we have templates for others to just pick up and lead on, the, on their own companies and their own engagements. A collaboration forum has been started, and Daniela mentioned it, called the Child Exploitation Working Group. It's free to join. It's a kind of low maintenance and low commitment where investors can really just share news and reports, engagement strategies and outcomes. It's a learning vehicle for us to really get up to speed more effectively and efficiently. And investors can use the new sector guidance coming out this summer that Daniela also mentioned to begin engaging with companies that you hold. So CBS organized an advisory committee of investors and child protection experts from five countries to look specifically at the ICT sector and across high-risk business types to identify and define expectations for minimal practice along with highlighting some leading responses that companies can take. CBS will be asking investors and PRI signatories to endorse this guidance when we launch it in the summer and before it is going to be sent to roughly 40 companies for a response on how they do, how they perform against the set of expectations. After that, we're really in a better position to begin benchmarking companies 
on their performance because it's quite difficult to do that now with a dearth of company reporting on this topic. And um, just the last slide, some miscellaneous steps. I'll just have everyone take a look at that. We're short on time, so I really want to get to q and A. I'll just highlight uh, update proxy voting guidelines. You know, we'll be looking at policy opportunities to weigh in as, um, you know, regulators increasingly look at the ICT sector writ large and where there might be an opportunity to push child protection issues in those conversations. But investors should also be looking internally at their own practices, their own IT departments, what they can do to keep this kind of material off their systems, and to reach out to your portfolio managers, whether internal or external, and educate them on this issue so they also can advocate. Um, so with that, I'll turn that over to Elena for Q&A. Thank you very much, Tracy, for that intervention and showing what investors could do on this space and, and how to engage with companies. I will open now for the question and answer sessions, and we have a couple of questions already posted in our Q&A um, box in, in the system. So um, our first question is, um, is the person saying, well, um, I might be mistaken. However, I believe there is a strong correlation between child exploitation and money laundry. So the question is, to what extent are the presenters collaborating with the Association of Certified Anti-Money Laundry Specialists? This is, this is Tracy Rembert. Jacqueline or Anjan might want to jump in here. I'll just mention that there is, um, you know, Jacqueline mentioned the Technology Coalition, which is where industry comes together to share best practice here. But before that, there was a financial coalition um, where credit card companies, PayPal, and others got together to really start tracking money flows related to this activity. Um, and that was effective in really shutting down a lot of abusive behaviors online, but it also had an unintended consequences from what I've heard from some child protection experts of driving some of that activity to the dark web where law enforcement and others have a harder time detecting and identifying the abuses going on. I um, haven't made any formal connections, but I have seen that issue come up a couple of times, and I think it is something that we want to weave into our engagements, and I didn't know if others had something to add. Um, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Tracy. Uh, Anjan here. Uh, you know, yes, uh, you are absolutely right. The Financial Coalition Against Child uh, Pornography, as it was called, uh, started uh, in the U.S. and then, uh, you know, it extended uh, to the East Asia Pacific where it operates. And I was part of some of the working groups as well. Uh, and what it did was to really uh, bring down the use of uh, credit cards and online payments, uh, the more um, prevalent forms uh, initially. Uh, but as, as you rightly said, uh, much of the uh, traffic uh, for commerce has been driven underground uh, in the darknet, and with the use of cryptocurrencies, it's adding um, you know another layer to it. Um, the, I, I, what I know is the, the financial coalition, both in the U.S. and in the East Asia Pacific, uh, are still functional, and they're working with the credit card companies uh, to share best practices and to make sure that the the, the, the existing uh, platforms uh, and the knowledge that they have uh, gained uh, through all these years are shared with other financial services, including the online money transfers. Thank you. Uh, we have a question for Jacqueline, and it's around the MS service agreements. And someone wants to know who signs the service agreement? Is it content provider, consumers, and why is this important? Uh, thank you. So the Microsoft Services Agreement, as I said, it governs all of our consumer products. So when you actually try to use one of our products, uh, you, are, you are receiving this and you are agreeing to the terms. Um, so if you were to search on, on Bing or, or, or via search engine and you just looked up Microsoft Services Agreement, it's basically our terms of use. So when you go through our products and it says, you know, I agree, this is what you are agreeing to. Um, the code of conduct is embedded in the Microsoft Services Agreement, and it spells out all of the terms and conditions uh, of, of our, our agreement. So there's a whole section on privacy, there's a whole section on your content and so forth, but the code of conduct is what specifically governs these particular issues. But everyone signs it, it's for consumers, it's signing it by, by agreeing to it. And by using the services, you are in fact agreeing to it. Okay, thank you. And the second question as well in terms of your um, different types of moderation. 
uh, the audience would like to know that how do you know um, this this um, is effective and comprehensive this moderation that you do how do you measure effectiveness of it we're we're mostly measuring the amount of content that we are finding on our services either being reported to us or uh, we are finding through our uh, detection mechanisms, particularly with photo DNA. Uh, it's a very difficult uh, problem to get around. Uh, metrics and measurement are, of course, very important, um, but they're largely proxies for what is happening. Um, and you can say that we might be finding more, but that's because photo DNA enables us to do so. So it is a bit of a um, difficult situation when it comes to measurement and metrics, but at least we know what we are seeing, what we are catching, um, and what we are uh, reporting to NECMEC in terms of a monthly basis. And NECMEC also comes back to each of the companies, uh, if they'd like, to share the arrests and convictions of uh, offenders. Uh, there, it's not a one-to-one -one match. So what we report, for instance, in April of this year is not going to be the same because it obviously takes years um, to go through one of those prosecutions. But we also uh, measure the uh, offenders that are actually uh, brought to justice as well. And this is Tracy Rembert. I think it will be hard as we work with companies to gauge, you know, what are effective metrics. And I think it will differ in a lot of cases from company to company because they are increasingly having multiple business models come under their umbrella. Some may have social media content, some may not. Some may have cloud storage, some may not. So it has to be tailored. But like Jacqueline said, they are proxies. But, you know, if you're really digging in on do you have effective reporting systems to make it really easy if users do find abuses to get them up the, you know, the, the, the stream to, to NECMEC, you know, to, to look at times of re response rates, um, how, you know, are user-generated reports to you or others from your services increasing over time? Maybe that means that's a proxy that you're doing a lot of good outreach and making it easy for people to do that. You know, there, so there are situations where I think you can, whatever issue you're focusing on with your engagement, you can kind of correlate some type of metric, I think, to at least understand what's going on internally. Um, and I would say, too, with the policies that Jacqueline mentioned, everyone knows, you know, on this webinar, many people don't read those policies. But the companies do often articulate how it is they're going to moderate, what they're going to block or not, what level of um, oversight they're going to have over the content that flows, and that gives them the power to then crack down on this issue. It does raise privacy issues at times, and that's an issue that we're constantly you know, trying to figure out where is the middle ground between privacy and censorship and protecting children, and that's an ongoing debate. But it does, you want to have strong policies so companies are protected in doing something on this issue. Thank you, Tracy. And uh, there is another question around more of um, global collaboration. So do you know of any efforts of police collaborating globally, or um, is there a way to know how concentrators perpetrators are. Um, yeah, I guess uh, for Jacqueline maybe, I mean, do you see differences <coughs> on online safety depending on geography and jurisdiction? I can certainly talk to global collaboration. I think both Anjan and I spoke of the We Protect Global Alliance. That is the uh, biggest forum that I know of for multi-stakeholder involvement in this issue. So there are right now 84 governments signed on to the We Protect Global Alliance. Uh, multiple companies, 20-odd companies, 20-odd uh, members of civil society organizations, uh, international organizations like UNICEF, um, the End Violence Against Children uh, Initiative, um, many, many uh, law enforcement agencies as well. And uh, these are all groups coming together, working across a, a multitude of sectors to make sure that everyone is kind of staying in their swim lane and, and holding up to their responsibility. That model national response that Anjan shared uh, is, is a great um, vehicle and framework for a country getting started in this issue. So if they're not willing to really acknowledge, it is a very delicate and sensitive uh, issue to talk about, but that is a great place to start, and, it's, and it spells out all of the responsibilities, all of the roles of the individual sectors and how they all work together. And again, everyone's staying in their swim lane, knowing when one set of responsibilities ends and another actor's set of responsibilities starts. Okay, thank you so much, Jacqueline. Yes, that was the question in terms of what were the efforts in terms of police collaborating globally. 
And I think okay. uh, well, we're coming to the end of the webinar, but Anjan, if you could uh, maybe, I mean, if you have that information, is there a way to know if, the, if there is con geographies that are more at risk that maybe investors could focus their efforts on as well? Yeah, well, I mean, as, as I said earlier, uh, this is a global issue. I, uh, even though there are certain geographies that are exhibiting it more prominently than others, uh, I mentioned the Philippines. Um, you know, we have uh, issues from Latin America, we have issues from Africa. Uh, uh, you know, UNICEF works in 150 plus countries, and through the We Protect uh, initiative, we have launched program in 17 countries from 2015 onwards. And the information that we are getting from the field uh, gives us the, you know, the, the information that children. Uh, in any part of the world uh, can be exposed to these dangers. So it would be uh, really uh, premature to um, to say that uh, certain geographies are excluded. Uh, having said that, we know that in the, you know, the, in the northern uh, sphere, um, in the more developed context, uh, countries uh, had been engaged on these issues and had the time to uh, to address and develop policies and take measures and had been a, a little bit more uh, you know has the advantage of time uh, for them to deal with these issues but um, you know we all know the mobile phones and the access to the internet uh, with the high speed uh, you know LTE access uh, uh, getting you know access to uh, all forms of communication uh, is pretty much uh, everywhere now so those countries who are beginning to you know embrace these technologies uh, with the the you know the highest uh, level of technology being deployed, uh, they don't have the bandwidth and they don't have the advantage of time to learn through these processes. So it's it's all the more you know important that uh, we we bring these resources, bring this understanding to them, and to you know prepare them uh, for for the future. I also just want to address one more point regarding the global law enforcement. Uh, Initiative. We know Interpol is obviously uh, the agency, and they have a uh, you know a, a global um, uh, network uh, to draw information from, and they have this ICSI database that they host. Uh, and it is very important that law enforcement from all countries. Currently, uh, less than 50 countries are connected to. The that database, and we're, uh, they are urging, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the the global um, world to to really connect with the database to share information about the victims, because the the, the central part of that database is to uh, to identify these victims and bring them back uh, to you know the normal life. And without uh, that kind of collaboration, global collaboration, uh, it would be impossible. Okay, thank you so much, Anjan. Uh, well, we've come to the to the end of the webinar, so thank you very much for everyone who attended and 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 is still with us online. Uh, as mentioned previously, the webinar, the recording of this webinar will be available on PRI's YouTube um, channel, so you can re-listen there and 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 watch again the presentations. And thank you so much to Danielle, Anjan, Jacqueline, and Tracy for taking the time today to talk to us about this very delicate and important issue. Um, so have a good rest of the day, wherever you are, and thank you very much from on behalf of PRI. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye now.